Good morning, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg for the Sales Pro Network. It's 10 o'clock on Friday, and that means here we are once again. I founded the Sales Pro Network to elevate the profession of sales. It's a place where you can come and share your successes, your challenges, get coaching from great people like uh, today's guest and many of my competitors are on here. We're always happy to answer your questions. And as you know, every Friday, we do a live interview with somebody who can add value to the world of sales. And I promise you, today is no exception. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects. In every organization that I walk into and with every person that I coach, the number one challenge is they're simply not speaking with enough prospects. And today I have brought for you, and you can thank me later, my friends, an expert in the world of prospecting. It's truly my pleasure to introduce you to Karen Kopp. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Yeah. So, Karen, um, I want to start uh, by taking something that I saw on your website, and it says... Imagine a consistent, predictable flow of new meetings without spending any time prospecting. Just give me a second. <sighs> I see that bubble above your head. <laughs> God, that sounds good. Because if there's one thing I hate doing, it's prospecting. In, in fact, uh, my favorite thing to teach people to do is how to cold call because you can see immediate results. I can teach you how to do it today and you can get a result tomorrow, but I would rather live in my car than ever have to do it again myself. So I'm very interested in hearing all that you have to say about how to develop a, a, a predictable flow of new uh, meetings, even though some people may, uh, may not be able to use your services on this call, but they'd certainly like to know how to prospect. Uh, Steve Kent, good morning to you. I bet you want to know how to prospect. So before we get into the nuts and bolts, can you just talk a little bit about maybe the two-minute version of what brought you up to this point, what got you to open this company, and what made you an expert? Sure. Uh, we've been in business for 21 years. I can't believe it's been that long. I was the original door opener, and now we have a whole team of senior level business developers who do the door opening for our clients. Uh, what brought us here it was a, a great idea in the gym of all places that I came up with. And uh, somebody was had a promotion agency and she was looking for someone to help. And I said, how would it be if I got you in the door with your prospects? And her jaw just dropped. And she said, you could do that? You would do that for me? I'm like, yeah, I could do that for you. And she said, when can you start? And that was the beginning. I was like, well, gee, I think I got something here. It is the, the single most difficult part of sales, I'm told over and over and over again, is getting in the door with prospects. Everybody who comes to my doorstep says, if you get me in the door, I can close most of the time. I just can't get in the door. And for those who can, like yourself, like what you were saying, I've never heard live in the car. The way I usually hear it, it's I'd rather put a stick in my eye than do that job. <laughs> That's pretty close. Well, well, for me, Karen, I want every call to sound like this. I, I, I want the call to sound like, so, so if I was calling you to get an appointment with you, I'd like to go, hi, Karen, this is Jeff Goldberg from Jeff Goldberg and Associates. And I want you to go stop right there. I've heard of you. I know you're so damn good that you're going to get the appointment. And I know that once you get out here, you're going to sell me. So why don't I just save us both some time and send you a check right now? Except I'm pretty sure you know that's not how most calls go. Right. Not most of them. But every once in a while, we do get a, a meeting on a first call. You might not get the $100,000 check on the first call. But we do have one client, and I don't know if you came across this on uh, the testimonials on our website, but she talks about the fact that on her first meeting, the CEO that she met with wrote her a check right there and then. And so I tell people, I'm like, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> you actually have to develop a relationship with people before they're going to write you a check. But before you do that, you have to get in the door, because if you don't get in the door, you don't get to do anything else. Yeah, yeah. In... in 16, 17 years of owning my own business, I've had exactly six one call closes. That's not a heck of a lot. Now, I sold Encyclopedia Britannica door to door for eight years, and that was a one call close. You either closed it or you never were going to, but that's just not the way it works in my business. So I'm not looking for that, but I do hate cold calling. So t tell us a little bit about what is the door opener service? The door opener service is an outsourced 
service that gets the door open with senior level business developer, well, using senior level business developers who represent our clients and make the calls. And we target a, a strategic group of hand selected prospects who are exactly right for our clients. We use sales messaging that's a direct hit for those particular prospects. Why should they take a meeting with our client? And then our door openers go out there and develop those relationships with these prospects who they don't know ahead of time and give them the reason why having a meeting with our client is one of the best decisions that the prospect's going to make all week. When the prospect says yes, we make sure that that meeting happens. Now, many of the meetings are virtual. So we do a warm handoff, meaning that our door opener is on the call with our client turns the meeting over to the client, sets the stage. And then if our client for some reason doesn't close up and get a next step with a date and time, our door opener will jump in there and get it. So the door opener represents our client's company as if he or she was a member of the client's company. So there's no confusion in, in the mind of the prospect as to where this call is coming from. Mm. Uh, so I'm going to make a wild assumption that your door openers, the people that you employ, are not uh, you know newbie salespeople who are just banging the phones one after the other. They're experienced people who, because yeah. from what you're saying, yeah. not only can they open the door, but they're going to help me uh, with the handoff, which th 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 there's an art to that too. So tell, can you tell me a little bit about the quality of the people or the time? Uh, yeah. the, uh, the... To, to work here, people have to have a minimum of 10 years experience in business development, but most of our people have more like 15 or 20 years in business development. Many of them have been corporate decision makers as well. That's the caliber of the person. But even that is not enough because you take that group of people, great hunters who have a ton of experience, and then you have to get to only those few who are really great, got it in their DNA, who can open up relationships with someone they don't know. They don't need to leverage their network in order to get the doors open. They know what to say and do. And so we have a very rigorous interview process here to make sure that those are the only kinds of door openers that we have. And then they not only get the doors open for our clients, they lead them through that first meeting. Some of our clients need more help than others. And then after the first meeting is over, we're paying attention to what happens in the sales process. So sometimes our clients will have like three meetings to close a sale, but we think they could do it in two. And then we'll make those recommendations because it's hard to see from inside the glass, right? So we're bringing insights and uh, market feedback from the calls that we're having. We could talk to more people than our clients can typically talk to. So we're learning all sorts of things about their target, the message that's working, what people are interested in and what they're not interested in. We bring that information back to our clients and then they could make decisions as to, do they need to change something on their website, which we don't do websites, or, or do they need to change something in their sales process? And then it's their choice whether they wanna implement that or not. Mm, gotcha, so, so I'm sitting here thinking, uh, Boy, I'll bet this is expensive, and I'm not asking you how much you charge, but I'm also thinking, how could I not afford to do this? Because how much more time would I have if I never had a prospect? I mean, first of all, uh, I, I told you why I despise it. I want every call to sound like, oh, yes, we need you desperately. Please come on in and meet with me. But right. that's not how it goes. So, uh, you know, how, how do your people deal with the I, I'm going to assume that they have less rejection than the typical salesperson, but they still get rejected a lot, don't they? Well, it's not really rejection. It's if we've done a good job targeting, it's prospect now or prospect later, customer now or customer later. If if we're if we've chosen a group of prospects who really need to know about our client, then it's just a matter of time and what we need to say to these people and information that we need to give them as to why a meeting would be so important to them and they shouldn't put it off. One of the things that we're doing now is we're adding trigger event targeting into our methodology, especially since the pandemic, because not every buying group is buying anymore. So sometimes you have to look a little harder for the people who are actually putting the money down. And that, that often will happen if, so, if a group of prospects has experienced some, some sort of a trigger event that's going on in their industries or for them specifically that we can leverage in the messaging and sometimes in the targeting, then we take this wide world of prospects and we make it more narrow 
and we focus on, on those people. We found that when we focus on prospects who are experiencing a trigger event, it's about half the number of touch points to a meeting versus prospects who are not experiencing a trigger event. And when somebody uses your services, are you developing the prospect list for them or is the customer saying, here's who I want you to call? Either way. So sometimes we develop the prospect list exclusively where we have a, a research department internally. We are strategic partners with Zoom Info. So we're able to pull all sorts of information, including attributes of prospects and things like that. And then our, our client approves the prospect list. Other times the client comes to us and says, I have a wish list of 50 people and here, here they are. If they know the companies, but they don't know the people, we'll fill in the people. If they know the companies and the people, but they don't know the contact information, we'll fill in the contact information. And then our researchers verify it, the contact information too, which makes the whole process more efficient. Interesting. Uh, again, I'm sitting here thinking, how could I afford to not do this? Because you know, every, you know, right. one, one of the challenges, especially for a solopreneur like myself, is every moment I spend prospecting is a moment I can't spend delivering. And every moment I spend delivering, I can't be prospecting and I need both. Right. One of the things I teach salespeople is that one of the main keys to being successful in sales is consistent prospecting because yeah, we, we, we cause ourselves a problem. You know, every time we close a deal, we now have to deliver. So we've got less time. And that's what I say cause. And of course, since most salespeople, I would suggest are pretty, maybe not as much as me are not willing to live in their cars, but they don't like prospecting because they get rejected a lot. So you've got this it's my least favorite thing to do. So it means it's the first thing that's going to go away. And that's what causes the ups and downs of selling. You know, you've got a good month and then a bad month and a good quarter and a bad quarter and a good year and a bad year. Inevitably, when I get hired as a coach and somebody says, yeah, I, you know, I had a bad quarter, I had a bad year, you know, let's take a look back in your calendar and see what was going on. Oh, I don't see prospecting here. What? Oh, well, I got busy. Right. Duh. Right. To, me, to me, it's prospecting every day. Of, of whatever type you're getting, if you're using the phone, that's great. Link, whatever you're doing, I, I advise a blended approach to my clients, but whatever you're doing, it's got to be consistent. Do you find the same thing in, in your business? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why when people hire us, they're hiring us for a weekly number of hours every week for a minimum of 18 weeks. But then as long as our clients are having the kinds of meetings they want, they just keep going. We have clients who've been with us six years and counting just because that top of, we're talking about the top of the funnel. So if we have the funnel like this, and most salespeople like to work that middle of the funnel to the, they really like the bottom of the funnel where they get to close. But then as those prospects are working down the funnel, your, your top of funnel becomes empty if you're not consistently prospecting. How do you, how do you uh, avoid that pro whole problem? Well, one way is to make sure that you're spending consistent time yourself um, and, you know, one of the, the biggest offenders to crappy prospecting is, is target. So if you're targeting too wide, you may be able to have significantly better results if you target more narrow and spend your valuable time on only those prospects who are more likely to say yes to you sooner than others. That's one of our approaches that we do. Uh, but it has to be a consistent block of hours every week against that group of prospects or they're not going to be enough here to get to the middle there. And that is what, to your point, makes those unnecessary peaks and valleys in revenue generation. Well, what can you do if you are completely full and you, you cannot take any time out of your day? Couple things. Uh, and of course, I'm gonna end with outsourcing <laughs> because that's the easiest way is to uh, ask the managers or go to your companies and say, listen, we need this, this service to outsource the door opening to us so that they're constantly feeding the top of the funnel so the producers can do what the producers do best. But let's say you don't have the luxury of having that kind of a service. What can you do? Uh, block time on your calendar and consider it as firm as a prospect meeting with a prospect you've been trying to meet for two years. You would never cancel one of those. Don't cancel your prospecting time. Really, really protect it. And then there's a mindset thing that goes on with prospecting because uh, prospecting requires a different mindset 
than servicing your current clients or dealing with prospects that are further down in your funnel. It's a whole different ball game. So it's, it helps to separate that work. And when you're focusing on prospecting with people you haven't yet met is to take that chunk of time and focus on them. This is a slow dance. I mean, if you're, if you're <laughs> telling people how to cold call, it's not a, hey, do you need it? Hey, do you need it? Hey, do you need it? If you're selling coffee to an office manager, maybe that works. But if you're selling a conceptual sale or relationship business, or even a business that uh, is highly competitive, like staffing or promotional products, one of those, it's really important that you do your research on an individual prospect to find out a little bit more about them so that you can further personalize the message. I don't know about you, Jeff, but I, I get 250 emails a day. All sorts of people want to sell all sorts of things to me. They don't research me. They don't say anything that was meant for me. What is it about what they're telling me that's going to make my life better? And by the way, if they're only sending me an email, that does nothing because I get 250 of those. I can barely read the emails from the people in my company. Forget about the people who are outside my company. But what people aren't doing who want to sell to me is they're not picking up the phone. Now my phone is right here. Here it is, even while I'm on Facebook Live, my phone is right here and anybody can call me. And I'll probably get like 50 phone calls at the end of this thing, right? <laughs> but anybody could call me because I'm right here. But the emails, I can't sift through all of those. So if you are a salesperson who's leaning heavily on email, you're hurting your chances of getting in the door. It's email, phone together, and then you can't say the same thing more than once. You can't call them back the next week with exactly the same message. So one of the things that our door openers do is that of course we start with some different themes from the messaging that we do before the program launches, but then they'll, they'll further personalize the email or the, the voicemail or the live dialogue based on the research that they've done. And then they'll note which theme that they focused on for the voicemail so that when it comes to next week and they're leaving the second voicemail for the same person, they don't say the same thing. They then pick, maybe it's a case study or an article, something that they've, they've read or researched, a reason why, a further reason why the prospect should say yes, assuming that the prospect remembers the voice the name, the company name, and then it's almost like a relationship with somebody you've never spoken to over time. But that only happens if you add voice. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. In fact, just before we got on, I ended a uh, coaching session with a guy up in Canada who uh, I, it was our, our first conversation. He was referred to me and he said, you know, Jeff, here's the problem. Uh, we had a very good success rate with our email marketing in 2019 but we were sending out the same emails in 2020. We didn't get the same response rate. I don't yeah. understand. And I said, really? What changed? And he started telling me about the, the things he changed in the email. And I said, no, 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 what changed? And it took him about five minutes before, before he said, oh, you mean COVID? I said, yeah, the world changed. You better change your messaging. And by the way, if you're only relying on email marketing, I think you might be making a mistake. I, I'm a big fan of a blended approach. And it sounds to me like from, from what you're saying, your, your people are not, uh, they're not magicians. They don't get on a phone and immediately get somebody an appointment. In fact, from the 18 week engagement, it sounds like you're building in enough time. So there are multiple touch points, which is truly what works these days. I mean, it depends on which study you read, but you know, between six and 13 touch points to, for anybody to get an appointment these days, you know, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's each individual prospect will have a different statistic. I mean, we're quoting averages, but each individual prospect will have a different statistic. So yes, six to 13, whatever it is, yeah, that's, that's about right. But some of them you get on the first try and others could take two years before they're ready. And I'll, yeah. I'll tell you a story about that. And this goes, this goes back, it's pre-COVID and it's to the very beginning of our business when I was doing the, the door opening for, for a client, they were a meeting planning company, they targeted pharmaceutical and uh, I was, calling prospects. I mean, this is me and way back when 
and I'm calling the prospects and there's this one woman at a, you know, fortune, probably 100 uh, pharmaceutical company. You probably can guess which one it is. But anyway, so I was calling this person and it was like year after year and I'd spoken with her, no need and I'm peeling the onion and I have my answers for the objections. And I, you know, like I'm kind of dweeby when it comes to this. So it's, it's like, if somebody doesn't have a need yet, how can I peel back that onion? So like I had approached her in every single different way and she really was hundred percent covered, but that that's okay because that situation may not always exist. So I'm going to continue to reach back out to her. So it, it finally, we get to this one day, Jeff, and I get to her name and I'm like, how long, like how long do you keep somebody in rotation? Like seriously? And, but I'm a very methodical person. So I couldn't bring myself, it's like physically painful for me to go to the next person. I couldn't do it. So I called her and she said, Karen, I'm so glad you called. Things have changed. Everything, there's a restructure, things have changed and we do wanna have this meeting now. And that meeting happened. My client actually got that business and then that big company merged with another big company, which I had already gotten for them as a client. And then they became the meeting planning company of choice for both companies. Had I not made that call that day, my client would never have had that meeting, didn't have any other way in the door. And they would never have been that vendor, which changed the whole landscape of their company. Yeah, th th there, there are uh, you know, a lot of sales sayings and one of them is persistence pays. And I could not agree with you more. Um, I have an average sales cycle. I sell, I don't think I said this in the beginning, I'm a sales coach and a sales trainer. Uh, so when I'm selling training services, I have an eight week sales cycle on average from the time I first meet with somebody till the time they say yes, if they're going to, the average is eight weeks. Now I told you I've had six or seven one call closes, but that's not average for me. And I had one that took me four and a half years four and a half years from the time I first spoke with the guy till he decided that he wanted to do business with me, but I was persistent. Now, I'm not calling that guy every day for four and a half years because over time, I space it out more, less and less frequently because I don't want to chase business that's not there. But after four and a half years, he was ready. And I do a lot of business with banks. And you know, there's not a heck of a lot of difference between banks. They all sell, have checking and savings, and most of them have mortgages and sell insurance the interest rates are within an eighth of a point. It's mainly a game of staying in touch with people and waiting for the other guy to screw up. And the perfect example is I did a ton of business with Citibank for a long, long time. They had my entire relationship. I, as you probably know, what banks are looking for is they want your whole relationship, they want your personal, they want your business, they want everything. Citibank had my whole relationship for a long, long time. And then they screwed up one time and they screwed up so badly that I was like, are you guys effing kidding me? Do you? Look, I certainly was far from their biggest client. I'm a solopreneur, so I'm not I'm not their biggest client. But I was so pissed off that I got in my car. I, I got a letter from them from South Dakota. Uh, uh, it was about a credit line that I was opening. And if I gave you how big I was asking for, you go, are you kidding me? They wanted seven. They wanted two years of my tax returns. I actually got somebody on the phone. I said, you need two years of my tax returns for this. You're holding more money in my accounts than that. I'm at. way more money. Why would you? Sir, we need it. I said, so you, you, and I actually went and counted. They wanted me to copy 72 pages of my tax returns and send them to you. Instead, I wrote on the letter, F you, except I spelled it out. I'm going to close every account. And I stuck it in the mail and I drove to my branch, spoke to my branch manager. I want every account closed right this second. I can't deal with you anymore because they screwed up. And that was the time that M&T, who had been courting me for years, got my business. Sometimes it's just waiting. So what are what are the five planks of the door opening success and what are your do door openers doing now that's working well okay so the five planks of door opening success are are the same as what they were before the pandemic but issues that are within those planks are a little different so the first plank is the right target not just any target strategically select the prospects i mean people on this on our facebook live they don't have a lot of time Right, if, and especially if they're working the middle of the funnel to the bottom of the funnel, they have to be super choosy 
about the prospects who they're talking to who are at the top of the funnel. So usually when you have a, a problem, especially like later on in the sales process, like let's say you've had a couple of meetings, you're having trouble closing them, usually the, the target is the offender. They never were the right target to begin with. So it makes sense from an efficiency standpoint, from opening the door through closing the sale to spend a little bit more time and be more choosy about the kinds of prospects who you target. So that's the first plank is, is the right one. And you know, as I was saying before, the people who were buying before the pandemic may not be the people who are buying now. Same is true of your centers of influence, by the way. The people who were the ones who referred most of your clients to you before may no longer be referring to you. And you may need new centers of influence, just like you need new targets. So the right target is plank one. Plank two is the right sales message. Now there's a big blind spot out there. People think that a marketing message is the same as a sales message, and that's not true. Value prop is not a sales messaging term. Value prop is a marketing term. And so what you say to a, an individual prospect, a, the spoken word, the email for one prospect that moves that person from one place in his or her thinking to the next, that's sales messaging. Now, if your sales messaging is not doing for you what you need it to do, it's time to go back and review what you say and what you write. And that is fully in your control. At the end, if they say yes or no, is that really, it's not 100% in your control. What you write, what you say, truly in your control. And you could either make a good impression and then you get to go further in the relationship or you can make a crappy impression and you go nowhere. If, it takes almost the same amount of time. So why not just do it right the first time? So the right prospect and the right message. Right prospect, the right sales message. The third plank is the right answers for objections. Not just any answer, but the right answer. And if you find that you're getting a very high percentage of your objections are falling into one bucket, you probably need to either change your target or change your message. And then you won't face as many of those objections. So think about that as you're going along with your prospecting. The fourth plank is the right door opener. Who's doing this work? Does this person have the time? Does this person have the talent? Does this person have the desire to do this part of the job? TTD. The, the patience. Desire. Sorry? The, the patience. patience. That, well, that's right. So, you know, do you have the time, talent, and desire to really do this job? And if you don't, you may not be the right person for the job. It's time to get some outside help uh, from maybe a company like ours. And the fifth plank is the right execution. Is it a phone call? Is it an email? How many phone calls? How many emails? Over what period of time? And how much time are you spending every week? You know, many of the sellers will tell me they just don't have enough time. And for those people, and, and some of them, that, that is absolutely correct. But in some cases, you're doing things you probably shouldn't be doing. So I recommend uh, what I call the NNR exercise. There's an article on this on my website if people wanna, wanna download that. Um, I recommend you keep track of time in quarter hour increments over two weeks. That's not very surprising for anybody who's studied time management, but here's the new piece of it. For every quarter hour where you're spending time on non-revenue generating activities, put an N next to it. If you're spending time on revenue generating activities, put an R and then count up how much time you're spending over the course of the two weeks. You may be shocked at how little time you're actually spending on revenue generating activities. Now it's time to take a look at the ends. How, how many of those activities should you not be doing at all? How many of those activities should be done by someone else, right? Or how many of those activities, you know, sorry, but you just have to do it. And so like one of the biggest offenders there is management. And, you know, look, I run a company, so I'm guilty of this too. Management comes to the salesperson and says, I need this report. Well, do they really need that report? Next time this, the seller can say to the manager, listen, that report is going to take me three hours to put together. Would you rather me work on that report or would you rather me call the next 25 prospects? Up to you. Just want to make sure I'm spending my time the way you want me to spend time. You'd be surprised how many managers are then going to say, huh, I think we might have an assistant who could put this report together. But the salespeople don't, don't tend to say that and put it into that kind of terminology 
for their managers. They just take the work and grumble and, and do it anyway, but then their activity goes down and it affects results. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fran from Texas says, good morning from freezing Texas. <laughs> Ket Greg good morning says, from freezing Jer New Jersey. <laughs> and freezing New York City, yeah. uh, well, Long Island. Uh, Greg Kettner in Walla Walla, Washington, where I bet it's freezing too, says great content. He likes what you're saying. Don right. Levine from West says hello from Westbury. And Welcome. Larry Weiss, the phone guy, has a question. Does customer service and support count as revenue generating or non-revenue generating time? Well, it depends on whether they're answering inquiries or they're using the ability to answer inquiries to upsell or cross-sell or do something that creates revenue. If they're only answering questions, I would say that is not revenue generating activity, but they're protecting your current client base. Also important, but it's not revenue generating. Got it, perfect. Got it. Anybody else has any questions, please type them in and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll share them along. So what's not working that salespeople should do, avoid doing? Well, they're trying to set appointments. Yeah, so what's not working, we, we covered already, but I'm gonna say it again, is email alone. I'm not saying don't do email. I'm not saying even don't do an email campaign. I'm, I'm saying email alone is not enough to open a relationship with a new person. Now, every once in a while, you'll get people who are gonna raise their hands from an email, that's awesome. You wanna do a couple of things. First of all, the person who raised their hand from the email, does that person represent an important win for you? If not, what are you gonna do about that? Is it not the right person, but it's the right company? So now you need to research and find out who is the right person, open up the dialogue there, right? And what are you gonna do for all the people who didn't raise their hand? It, it's time to reach out to them and that requires phone and personal outreach in order to, to create the relationship. Another thing that's not working is not enough time. We've, we've circled around this issue a couple of different ways, but I'm gonna hit it square, square in the eyes. Not enough time. When you do that NNR exercise and you count up the amount of time you're spending on revenue generating activities, if you find that you're spending two hours a week on revenue generating activities, chances are you're not going to generate as much revenue as you had hoped. There is a direct correlation between time spent and success as long as you're doing this right. So if you're only spending a little bit of time you're only spend, you're going to have a little bit of success. You're not going to be able to focus on as many prospects as you need to. And that puts a lot of pressure on the prospects who you did meet. They must say yes, or your closing ratio is going to be for crap, right? That's why you have to have enough conversations going on out in the market in order to bring enough of the right prospects to the first meeting and then go through your sales process. Let me just stop there and, and see what, what you wanna talk about next, Jeff, but I could keep going on, on some of these. And I could listen to you all day long because <laughs> you, you see me nodding my head and smiling. I mean, I do that, that same uh, time management exercise with my clients, although I have them do a week instead of two, but, but yeah, I mean, most people, most salespeople have zero idea where their time goes. And it's such an eye opener when we go back over it. It's kind of like, uh, uh, many diet programs, you know, they'll have you track everything you eat for two weeks. And I speak from experience. And every time I've done that, it's like, oh, my God, look at what I'm putting in my body over a two week period. It's insane. And it's the same thing with where our time goes. If we're honest with ourselves, most of us are wasting a lot of time instead of investing it wisely. Uh, to me, the most important thing, and this should be music to your ears, uh, the, the most important thing a salesperson can do any day is prospect for new business. Yes, we have to take care of current clients, and yes, we've got to do all kinds of other stuff, but there's a, a relationship between prospecting today and getting paid tomorrow, except you don't prospect today and get paid tomorrow. You prospect today and get paid way down the line tomorrow, and any day that you don't prospect means there's a day somewhere down the line you simply cannot get paid. So well, I, 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 I could talk to you all day about this so, stuff. But let, let's talk about that and, and crystallize this for people. Let's crystallize this picture for a second. Let's think about your sales cycle, the amount of time it takes to go from a first meeting to a closed sale. Now, that's going to vary for everybody who's on the phone. Some people, and, and it also varies as to whether the prospect comes from a referral versus uh, an outbound, by sure. the way. Yeah. So when you're thinking about how much revenue you want for this year, you need to think about where you are in the year. So if you say, okay, it's, it's February now, I've got 
all these different things that I really have to do. And I'm not going to be able to start prospecting until probably June of this year. But you have a nine month sales cycle. Guess what? That isn't, those aren't sales for this year. Those are sales for next year. So it's really important you factor in the sales cycle when you think about how much revenue you have promised somebody to deliver in the course of the year and then be a realistic about it. Because what happens that this is what we experience anyway, is that when somebody doesn't do that math and it's, it's just math and averages and things like that, but if they don't do that math, then they need to figure out a way to get the revenue this year and then they start doing all sorts of things like cutting their prices, selling ancillary services just so they can get these tiny quick wins in order to fulfill the promise they made this year. But then while they're doing that, guess what they're not doing for next year? They're not setting themselves up to have the important wins for next year. So the longer you wait to start prospecting with the right kinds of prospects, the longer you're going to wait to have the right kind of funnel that not will feed you the important wins. Yeah, not only that, but uh, if you wait until you're out, you've finished everything else, and now, oh my goodness, I don't have anything in the pipeline, now that desperation is there, and that's the worst time you could possibly reach out to somebody, because I say prospects smell commission breath or, or need or greed like dogs smell fear, and that's the worst time. It's, it's that consistency that's key. And, and something else you just said rang 100% true for me. So uh, with sales coaching, it's usually a very quick sales cycle, but sales training, I told you it's eight weeks. Right. Any, any process I start right now, we're talking Q2. Q1's over for sales training. There's nothing right. I can do. I mean, if I got incredibly lucky, I could close a deal that I started today, but I don't, I'm not a big fan of depending on luck. I, I find the harder I work and the smarter I work, the luckier I get. And, so, and uh, salespeople... The, for those of, of, of the pe people who are listening in who are salespeople, it's important to manage up on those expectations. We had a door opener client years ago. It was a big software system. They had to replace the software system that an enterprise company had in order to get theirs in. It was an 18 month sales cycle. No joke, 18 months. Yeah, software. So our job was to get the door open with the initial decision maker on behalf of the company, which we did. But the CEO of the company who didn't understand this math told his sellers, don't focus on anything that isn't going to close or a high likelihood of closing inside of six months. That math <laughs> doesn't, as a Venn diagram goes, those two circles don't intersect. Yeah. Zero. <laughs> so sellers, if you are in this situation and your management hasn't done the math, you really need to talk to them about the reality of the math so that they can adjust their expectations and therefore the quota along with timing. Like quota is a funny thing too. Like, oh, make this, all this. Yeah, but in what time frame? Because that has to do with sales cycle. And People who don't really understand that don't think about it, but it can really interfere not only with the revenue creation, but the money that the sellers are making for their families. Yeah. Uh, so I've heard you talk about calls and emails. Is that what your company focuses on or are you using social media or something else in, in your outreach or is it just calls and emails? When we use social media, it's direct to an individual, right? So we're not a social media company, that is a marketing activity. Putting something out on social media is a marketing activity. It's awareness building. You hope to get a couple hand raisers and a little bit of engagement. What we do is we open up a relationship with someone new who is exactly the right person. So whatever the vehicle is that does that, and it's typically phone and email, uh, occasionally we'll use LinkedIn, but direct to a, an individual. And it's not the surfacey kind of LinkedIn where, you know, do you ever get one of those? <laughs> where so, oh, I got one. I got one that says, hi, and then in parentheses, it said, contact name here. And this person actually wanted to develop a relationship with me. Really? I'll, I show that in my seminars. I put that up, but I'm very nice about it, Jeff, because I block out the guy's last name, but his picture is still there. But I block out his last name because, you know, I'm not mean, but for goodness sakes, don't do that. But I get 
I get a lot of um, e LinkedIn requests with people and, you know, sometimes people just want my contact content. So I might say yes. It's not that I want to buy from somebody they, you know, but then they think they they're like my best friend and that they should buy the house next door to me. Right. No, I don't know you. So if you are going to reach out to somebody using LinkedIn, I highly recommend this is what we do. They, we're, it's phone and email first. Right. It, it might be a couple of those. And then if you can't connect with somebody on phone and email, then reach out to them through LinkedIn. But don't assume that you know them better than you do. An another thing when it comes to if people are using email tracking tools, um, which can be very helpful, though, please turn them off when you have a meeting with a prospect so they don't pop up and people can see <laughs> that you're tracking all of their emails. But anyway, um, don't assume that just because somebody opens your email, it means anything. It could be a mistake, right? That, so the open rate doesn't really matter. The click rate, if you send them something with a link on it and they've clicked on it, now that's a little different. That shows a little bit more engagement and interest. What we really like to see is when the decision maker we've sent the email to has forwarded it to a lot of the right decision makers within that organization. That's like ding, 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 ding. You know, so yeah, phone, email, LinkedIn, as it makes sense, depending on the industry, we may send something. You know, we don't do a lot of mail. We don't do a lot, but like promotional products, something like that, uh, we do. Now that people are working from home, you can't say, can I have your home address? Because that's creepy. But um, you, could, you could say, uh, can I have your remote address? I'd like to send you something. That's a little better to say it yeah. like that. And even like if you're asking for someone's cell phone number, you don't say cell phone number because that's also a little creepy. But you could say, uh, can I have your remote number? Got it. Yeah. So yes, like you, I get those LinkedIn requests all day long. Yeah. And it's always, I help coaches like you get 10 million qualified leads in 10 seconds for free. Would you like to talk? <laughs> no. If you could really do that, of course, I'd like to talk to you, but you can't. So stop doing this to me. But I produce a lot of content on LinkedIn. So I accept every request because you're, you're connected to me. Guess what? You're going to see my content now. Right. But yeah, I, I can't stand that. And like you, you, you said before, you know, 250 emails, that's a light day. Uh, I, I can't possibly open them all. And I'm so with you. You, you know, I'm, I'm coming back to something you said earlier about, you know, do a little research. I, more than once, I've gotten a, 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 an email, and I think I got a LinkedIn uh, reach out also from, uh, Dear Jeff, we, we feature, uh, I forgot the exact wording, but high-powered executive women like you in our publication. I'm, I'm like, I'm not a girl. Did you look at my picture? I may not be handsome, but I'm not a girl. You know, I, I, I think I look like a guy. I, I, I don't know. So yeah, it, it, it's just insane. Well, uh, you bring up an, a, an important point and it's really, it, I think we should make it here, even though it might seem very obvious, but when you're in a detail oriented business, details really matter. Now you told that story here. You didn't say the person's name, but I'll bet you're never going to do business with that company. Of course not. Right. Of right. course not. So, so be careful about what you put into the content. I like to say uh, language plus delivery equals outcome. What you say and how you say it determines the result. So delivery systems matter. <laughs> what you say and how it's structured or what you write and how it's structured matters. I mean, you also brought up a, like a crazy statistic. Well, you know, if you're reaching out to somebody who's fairly sophisticated, they could do the math. And so here somebody sent this crazy statistic to Jeff and he didn't believe it. So if you're saying that you can help somebody, uh, you know, save all this money, is it believable? Because if it's not believable, even if it's true, if it's not believable, you've just caused a disconnect when it sure. comes to the sales messaging. You want to avoid disconnects at all costs. Yeah, I, I mean, I exaggerated a bit. They didn't really say 10 million qualified leads for free in 10 seconds, but it was, you know, hundreds of qualified leads, you know, making promises that, look, I'm an expert at this. You're an expert at this. I can't deliver that. You, If you've really got a way to do that, I'm interested, but it, it's BS. Uh, so, so, you know, I, 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 I really take exception with people who are still doing that lying, cheating, thieving, exaggerating, uh, you know, for me, after my three kids, my integrity is the most important thing in the world. And if I can't sell something, prospect, sell with integrity. 
I got to go find something else to do. So that just doesn't work for me. Larry, I apologize, Larry. It's either Lumberman or Loomerman is asking, may I ask if you have a program to open doors for people who are in underqualified jobs? The pandemic forced me to take such a position. Your door opener service would be phenomenal to help me get into my top 10 list of employers. Oh. Do, you do you only provide the door opener service to businesses? I would pay a fair amount to be <laughs> highlighted by someone like Karen Kopp. Outstanding conversation, Mr. Goldberg and Ms. Kopp. Oh, okay. Well, forget about that part. But this guy would pay you a fair amount. So do you work with people like Larry? Well, we work with businesses. So, so I'm sorry, Larry, we don't work with individuals um, who are looking for jobs. However, if you focus on the five planks for yourself, you don't have to boil the ocean. Pick the top 10 companies that would be grateful to have you who are hiring now, right? Or maybe they're not hiring, but they should be hiring because something has changed in their companies that you can really help them do that likely their salespeople are not doing so well for them. Listen, guys, there, there are a lot of companies out there who are struggling to switch to virtual selling. Uh, you know, in the very beginning of the pandemic, some people were just hoping this would go away. And we're, my message was always get in there and this is the time to talk to people. But now so many months later, people know that they have to be selling now. They just, they just do, because people need to buy, right? Not only do you need to sell something, but actually people need to buy. So it, it's important to be out there, but not everybody's comfortable with this. And if you are comfortable with this, you may have a leg up versus other organizations where their sales team is still struggling. So my recommendation for you, and thank you for asking, uh, is to take a look at who needs to know you. What are, who are the top companies that need to know you and craft something really important to the CEO or the VP of sales as to why you could really knock it out of the park for them in a way that they might not be experiencing right now and to suggest a, a time to connect. That's great. And Larry, you're certainly welcome to post here in the Sales Pro Network that you're looking for something. Tell a little bit about yourself. We uh, we don't sell to each other here in the network. We're not here to promote each other's businesses. But you know, I'm I'm certainly happy to approve a post if you if you'd like to say I'm looking for a new opportunity. Here's what I can do. Happy to do that. Uh, Larry Weiss, the the phone guy, says you don't have to boil the ocean. What a great expression. And Karen Miracle said, really great content today. And I promise you, that's a high compliment. She's a Sandler trainer, so she knows what she's talking about. So uh, I love the Sandler change. Sandler trainers are, are, are great folks. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to be able to have that methodology from beginning to end. One of our biggest clients came to us as a referral from one of the Sandler trainers in, in Canada. So um, yes, we thank you for that. Well, if the two of you would like to meet each other, let me know. I'll be happy to make that introduction. Yeah, that you're, you're right, Car Carol, Karen. Karen is both two Karens. We should just hook you guys up. Yes, absolutely perfect. So I, I see we're already 13 minutes away from ending. I've only got about 75 more questions. I'm trying to figure <laughs> out. But here's, what, here's one that I, I think everybody would be interested in. What about voicemail? So to me, one of the keys to being successful in getting appointments is to leave a good voicemail. Although every time I teach people to do it, uh, there's always somebody who raises their hand and says, no, I never leave voicemails. And when I ask what the, I, I know what they're going to answer, but I need to hear from, why don't you leave voicemails? Because nobody calls me back. Well, great. Maybe you need to leave a better voicemail. So what's your <laughs> take on voicemails? And what do you, I mean, do you think they, I think I heard you say that your people do leave them. What's an yes. effective voicemail message? Yes. So there's like a, about 10 questions in what you just said. So I'm going to start systematically because I'm a very methodical person going back to the, the question, do you leave a voicemail? Yes, absolutely leave a voicemail. Uh, it is the one-on-one uh, -on -one advertisement to your decision maker. That person, even though they might not call you back, they might not ever call you back, but they are hearing your voice. And that means you're becoming human to them. Email is flat. I'm not saying don't send one. I'm just saying it's flat. You can't interact. They, there's no human flesh and blood. There's no tone. You can't judge tone. That. Yeah. And, and you're a person. It's very hard for people to be rude. Most people. They're very hard for people to be rude to people. So when they hear your tonality that they, you really care about them, it's a whole different ball game versus your competition who's only sending emails. So do you leave one? Yes. Uh, leave a good one. I, I heard you say that. So what is the definition of good one? Language plus delivery equals outcome. Six sentence voicemail. 
six sentence max. And don't tell me you have a lot to say, sorry, six sentences max. And uh, there's an article on my blog, on my website, which we'll give you in a few minutes, that gives you the detail of the six sentence voicemail. It's uh, two of those sentences are going to be the crux of it. And those are the ones you really have to nail. You need to be articulate. You want to avoid creating a disconnect, get rid of any fluffy language that's meaningless, like boutique. What, what does boutique company mean anyway? So get rid of that. Things like we give good customer service. If you don't give good customer service, go home. You, this, that's the price of entry just to be in business. You have to do that. So make sure that every word in each of those sentences is working as hard for you as it possibly can. Then your it's language plus delivery equals outcome, delivery. What do you do? Leave yourself 10 voicemails. You're going to pick it up, hear how you sound, put the hat of your prospect on and hear how it lands. How's that landing? If I were my prospect, would I take a call from me next time? It doesn't have to call you back, but would I take a call from me next time? Am I stuttering? Uhs and ums, is the voicemail only about you? Nobody cares about you. Don't say things like, I'd love to meet with you. I know why you would love to meet with them. What I don't know is why they would love to meet with you. And that's the only thing that matters. And that is what you need to put in that voicemail. So is it a voicemail? Yes, it's a voicemail. For those of you who are leaders on this call, when's the last time you heard a voicemail from one of your people? Because it's a very easy thing to fix, but it's very hard to come back from a crappy one. You can't leave another one next time and come back from the bad one that you left the first time. And besides, and if you leave crappy ones for me, I play them for my audiences during seminars. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's the same thing when you're talking about uh, an email. You've got to have a great subject line. And I always say, take I out of it. Nobody cares about you. What they're looking for is how are you going to help me? And I love the way, how did you say it? Language plus uh, language plus delivery equals delivery. outcome. I, I love that beyond belief because I tell salespeople all the time that words matter. You need to pay attention to every word you're saying. And I believe truly one word can make the difference between closing business and not closing business. Yeah. And if you think your prospects aren't paying attention, they are. And if they're not, you shouldn't be there, but they're listening for everything. And what they're really listening for is, you know, I, I hate, I guess I don't hate to use old expressions. It's the whip them. It's the what's in it for me. And when it's, when it's all about me, the salesperson, they don't care. They don't give a hoot. E even clients that I have have long-term relationships with who, and some of who become actual friends, I'm pretty certain that they would prefer it if I would pay them to let me do my job rather than them have to pay me because they're interested in them and their businesses. Uh, well, that, that's right. And you brought up a really important point that one word could change an outcome. And that is true. When I do this, my seminars, we talk about word pairs. I put up word pairs on the screen and we talk about the difference. And like, if you think about something like we have uh, satisfied clients versus we have grateful clients, right? One word difference, completely different meaning. There's another word pair that I like also. I'm, go I'm gonna show you how this works versus I'm going to prove to you how this works. Whole different ball game, whole different ball game. So when you're, writing out your messages or when you're leaving messages for yourself, make sure that every single word is working as hard for you as you can, because if you change the words, it can change an outcome. If you change a phrase, it can change an outcome. Like we do, I do phrase pairs too. And uh, like, think about, <clears throat> I'll call you next week versus how's next Thursday at 10. Whole different ball game. Sure. Completely shorten your sales cycle. Absolutely. A million percent. Uh, you know, you, you got me with the satisfied clients thing because I talk about this all the time. You know, I, I actually will say to a prospect when we're very close to the end of the process, look, here's who I am in the matter. I'm going to bend over backwards and break my own back to make sure you're thrilled. I'm going to exceed every expectation because I don't need any more happy clients. And I then pause <laughs> to let that sink in. And most people go, why wouldn't you want happy clients? Happy clients are a dime a dozen. It's easy to make people happy. It's easy to satisfy them. Uh, and I always say to people, I'm doing this, by the way, for selfish reasons, because ecstatic clients, when I exceed your expectations and you're thrilled, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to stick around a long time. 
And as the longer we do business, the less cold calls I have to make. And I don't mind teaching your people to do them, but I don't want to do them. And the other thing is ecstatic clients, they refer others without me having to ask. So I'm being selfish when I say I'm going to thrill you. I'm going to blow away every thought that you have about what you're expecting from me. Happy, satisfied? Oh, I, I, I've given this example before, but I was once introduced by a networking associate to somebody else, unannounced, sent an email, copies me, and he said, I'd like you to meet with Jeff Goldberg. He's a very competent sales trainer. And I, I certainly appreciated the that I was being introduced to somebody, unannounced, but when I saw my friend, I'll just say his name is Steve, it's not, but... Uh, because uh, some of the people here might know him. But you know, I said, Steve, why did you introduce me as a competent sales trainer? He goes, because you are. You're very competent. And my response was, Steve, I'm so far beyond competent, I can't even see it in the rearview mirror. I'm amazing. I'm astounding. I produce incredible results. I, I'm a, I, Something like that. And his response was, well, I don't like to oversell. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that you and I talked about when we first met each other a while back was the importance of the blurb in networking. And Jeff and I exchanged our blurbs so that this is for times when people are going to refer you to what hopefully is your ideal client, your definition of an important win, is to have a, a blurb, three to five sentences. I'm not talking about uh, a pair, like several paragraphs. I'm not talking about a link to your website. I'm not talking about 50 attachments and one of them in the form of a PowerPoint with video. No, I'm talking about three to five sentences that you can give to those who refer you for times when they are going to refer you and you want to ask for an email introduction so that you have permission to email that person and you maintain control over the introduction. So if you don't have one of these, Jeff and I both have them. We gave them to each other when we first met so that when Jeff refers me to people he knows or when I refer Jeff to people I know, I just take it in Jeff's words, Jeff's words, and introduce him to somebody I know so that he could maintain control over the language part of that particular part of the sales process. And then so can I, I, I can tell the story our story better than other people can, why wouldn't I give them that tool? If you don't have one, make one for yourself. Three to five sentences max. Exactly right. I can sell me better than you can, and you're an expert. Just like you can sell. Look, I'm pretty damn good at selling, but you know how to sell you better than I know how to sell you. So why not? That's the first thing I do whenever anybody offers to make an introduction. I always say, would it help if I wrote it for you? Uh, it'll save you some time. And I don't really care about saving them some time, although that's part of it. What I really care about is I want the person they're introducing me to to hear my words, because I promise I'm not going to describe myself as competent. Oh, I am, but I'm a little <laughs> bit beyond that. We're, that's we're so a low to... bar word for you. Yes, it's, thank you. I, 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 a, a little bit better than that. So I really have only time for one more question. I'm frantically looking over the, the long list that I still have. I, I hope that you'll accept my invitation and come back sometime. Um, let's yes, go with this. this. is fun. Let's do it again. How about tomorrow? <laughs> um, so, so on your website, you give a tip and it says, make sure you're top of mind with prospects in meaningful ways so that when they are ready to spend, uh, you will be there too. And when you focus on the health and depth of your relationships with people, the money follows. So what are some quick tips in the two or three minutes we have left for staying top of mind? Because I think this is crucial. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to use your CRM. Yes, I said that word, use the CRM because there's a feature in it. If it's not turned on, please turn it on. It's called set task. You're going to set tasks. There's a next step date and time for every part of the sales process with every important win prospect for you. Make sure you're using set tasks so you never blow over somebody and you say three months later, ooh, whatever happened with that one? Use your set task feature for that. If it's not a customer now, it's going to be a customer later. Uh, so make sure that you're constantly staying in touch with that individual. They might have asked you for a proposal. I call these no-go proposals. They might have asked you for a proposal, but they didn't move forward with you or they didn't move forward at all. That doesn't mean they like the vendor they chose. It doesn't mean that they're not ready for you now. And that's, that set task is always going to keep you on track that you're checking in. What do I mean by meaningful ways? Saying I want to touch base with you is fluffy. It's vanilla. Nobody cares. And it's all about you. 
So what is it that you really want out of that communication? If it's now time to have a, another call, uh, ask for one. If you want a meeting, ask for a meeting. Don't make your prospects work so hard to know what you want. Also, just because you sent an email out, if you didn't get a reply, does not mean that you've actually done anything, right? So you even, even further into the nurture process, make sure you're reaching people. And so if you don't reach them, set a task for yourself to, to reach back out. Uh, if some, I know some sellers will say to me, well, I did email them. Oh, wow, well, really? Well, so what? You know, now let's get them on the phone, call them, send them a message through LinkedIn if, if they're not responding to you on, uh, on phone or email. Uh, sometimes people will see that when they don't see the, the email in the 250 that they have. So that's really what I mean. And don't give up. Uh, Dan Kennedy says, uh, the difference between garbage and salad is timing. So hang in there because your competition I, I won't. That. I love that. Yeah, I, I just did a video, I think it was a, a week ago about, are you touching base or are you touching base? And if you're just, if you've delivered a proposal and you're just, call, hey, I'm just calling to touch base, don't save your breath, save the time. Just or call check in. You, you better I'm checking add, in, who cares? Yeah, yeah just <laughs> following up. <laughs> you know what that really means? I'm just following up. It means, did you decide to do business with me but forget to let me know? Don't uh, add some value every single time. Uh, we're actually out of time, but I've got one more question from uh, somebody who I highly respect, if you don't mind. We'll go like two minutes over. Uh, this gentleman is a VP of sales and uh, manages a team of salespeople. Uh, Iris says, my salespeople are often forced to leave a message with a frontline worker, like a gatekeeper, in efforts to get a decision maker on the phone. Any suggestions on getting that frontline worker to convey the message in a way that will actually get the decision maker to call back or take a future call? Okay, a couple things about that. If you hit the frontline worker, you need a different message for that frontline worker. The same message for the decision maker is not going to work with the worker. The worker has to understand <clears throat> why it's in his or her best interest to make sure that the person you want to talk to talks to you. Separately, gatekeepers are not as much a factor right now with people working from home. So we're not really hitting that a whole lot. If you are, um, that, not sure exactly why, but <clears throat> we're not, for those people who are working from home, it's not as much of a factor anymore. There are different roadblocks, but, but not that one quite as much. The other thing is you can try to reach the decision maker directly, um, sending an email on a, a Sunday. Uh, we'll usually get to that person without the gatekeeper. Uh, also sending the LinkedIn that goes right to an individual as opposed to, um, yeah, but I know we're at the, the top of the hour, but uh, yeah, happy to answer any other questions. I know Jeff is going to put some contact information up. Please reach out to me. Actually, I'm doing that right now. Could you just let people know if they want to reach out to you, if they uh, want to uh, speak with you, how would they get in touch with you? What's the best way? Yeah, you can go right through our website, copconsultingusa.com, and just fill out the contact us form, and we'll make sure that, that either I get to you or my assistant will make sure that we get to you right away. Uh, you can link in with me. I, I put content out periodically. I aggregate the information of what's working from our door openers, and I'm, I'm happy to share. For people who want some assistance with door opening, or maybe you've never even thought that that was a possibility and you want to learn more about it, uh, just reach out and we'll get you the information you need. And, uh, you know, w while some of the people on the call might not uh, have the investment uh, money to be made to work with a service like yours, I did see on your website, you, you've got uh, the path to gas objections, man, cash to path to cash objections manual, and mm -hmm. that's well under $100. So very reasonable. So, you know, and my book, Biz Dev Done Right, Amazon yeah. bestseller. There you go. <laughs> Karen, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for how generous you've been with your time and advice. Uh, I, I could talk about prospecting all day long and I sure don't know it all. I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for everybody in the Sales Pro Network when I say thank you so much for generously sharing your time. I hope you will come back soon. Any final words for you? No, thank you for having me. And I guess the only thing I'll say to everybody is we are getting our clients in the door with their prospects across industries every day and you can too. Just follow the things we talked about today and all of Jeff's great advice. Or reach out to Karen because you've now got her contact information because she can help you so you can keep on selling. As I do every time, I'm going to end this with saying this. Sales is a game of making things happen. Get out there and make sales happen. Thank you so much, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.